It's the BBP TV show since 2012, where amazing guests share their digital adventures. Who will we meet today? Small biz influencer? Up and coming trendsetter? Accomplished author? You never know who'll be dropping by. And now, here's your host, Elaine Lindsay, the bionic glamourpreneur with Truel Social Media, who's the second most curious person on the planet. Hello, hello. I am so thrilled to be back. Um, I'm really, really thrilled to be back with a returning guest. Hello, Tina. Hey, Elaine. It's been a long it, time. It has. I was just mm -hmm. thinking, my God, it has literally been years since I got to have Tina on the show. Uh, yeah. Tina is, well, quite frankly, one of my favorite people. Oh. Tina is deep, deep into audiobooks and publishing. So I suggest you seriously listen up. You can find some phenomenal tips on this show. But just let me give you a little rundown of all about Tina. She's an award-winning, internationally acclaimed speaker. She's an audiobook publisher, as I mentioned, a podcast producer, influence and vocal leadership expert who's been featured on media outlets including ABC, Inc.com, Huffington Post, and Forbes. Tina has a podcast called The Start Something Show, and um, it was named as one of the top 35 podcasts for entrepreneurs by Inc.com. Her company, Twin Flame Studio, amplifies all you do and the influence of leaders, experts, and companies all around the globe. So listen up, folks. You're going to get some goodies here today. Awesome to have you, Tina. Oh, it's so great to be here. I really appreciated you reaching out. It's been so long, and there's been so many things that have happened, so many things that have changed uh, in the last couple of years since we last talked. So, um, yeah, let's, let's dig in wherever you want. Absolutely. And, and that's actually part of it. It's so exciting to, you know, catch up with people down the road. Um, your start something show was phenomenal. And you got as you got further and further into audiobooks, uh, it is quite frankly, you know, to me, the way to go audiobooks and podcasts, I think, are the absolute bomb dot com. Because you can take them anywhere, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Audio is definitely the most portable form of media. And uh, that's one of the reasons that it has experienced such a, uh, a renaissance, really, and not even a renaissance, but just the an incredible growth in the last five years of audio. And it's it's so durable. It's never it's never been a fad. It'll never be a fad. It's very reliable. It's very accessible. Um, and that just makes it easy. Absolutely. And I can remember back I, I'm actually thinking like 80s or 90s, uh, my dad was starting to have trouble with singing, to be able to read. And, you know, as far back as then, you were able to get what they quote unquote books on tape. Absolutely. But, but it, you know, so it's, it's definitely uh, been around long enough to have made its mark. But let's talk about the small entrepreneur in terms of audiobooks, I know a lot of small entrepreneurs think, oh, God, like, I'm not ready for, for that uh, arena. I mean, that's way beyond me. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, mo a most of our clients on the audiobook side of the company, you know, we have uh, audiobook full done for you nonfiction uh, production, publishing and distribution. And we publish a lot of audiobooks in conjunction with our partners who are in the publishing industry. I have a, a network publishing uh, kind of you know, gathering tea party every every month with my colleagues. And we share tips, we share what's happening in the industry and all that. And all of these folks, what binds us all together is that we represent a segment of the publishing industry that really gives a crap, first of all. And that is all of us sharing stories, like some days it's more support group than, you know, networking group, is, uh, is that we all had experiences in the publishing industry or we've had experiences with business that were predatory, that were difficult. And as entrepreneurs, what do we do? We say, you know what? I can do it a better way. 
I can help people better. I can do it, you know, or, or they had friends and colleagues who said, oh my God, you published your book. Can you publish mine too? And it ended up creating a snowball effect for a lot of these small publishers. So most of our clients are these uh, subject matter experts. They are uh, entrepreneurs. They are consultants. They are coaches. They are people who are uh, pivoting from corporate into consulting. And they've written a book based on their deep experience to help audiences learn more about them, to create an entry for them into that market. So audiobooks have become a really natural extension of that because audio is so popular. And audiobook, uh, the audiobook market has always been big. I mean, you mentioned books on tape. The first audiobook was actually recorded around 1930. Yep. This is not new. And uh, so, you know, what uh, the rise of Audible and Amazon becoming the same company a bunch of years ago. I mean, we're, we've seen double digit growth year on year the last eight years with audiobooks. And so it's a perfect time for small business to explore this. And now with the technology that we have and the processes we have, we can make most people sound really good narrating their own audiobook, or we have an amazing tribe of professional narrators who can bring those books to life in a way that is affordable, in a way that's convenient, and we can reach so many more people. And that was, for me, that was key to sort of get that out there at the beginning of us talking, because there's so much more we have to discuss about who you are and what you do. But <laughs> I wanted the solopreneur or the, or the very small company to understand this is not beyond you. We're not talking at a corporate level. We're not talking simply influencers or people who have done books before. We're talking about every person who is in business, every small entrepreneur who, who really has a passion for what they do and wants to get that message out there. And I, I think that's, for me, that was sort of the, the one piece I wanted to be sure that we, we got out there first right. and understood this is not over your head. No, so, not at all. Okay, so let's go back to, God, I, I think 2016 is maybe the last time you were on the show. Oh, my crap. Really? I know. It. I thought, oh, my God. It doesn't seem that long. Yeah. I know. But, I mean, we've talked a little over things have drastically changed <laughs> they have. Um, for both of us in in a lot of ways for you i would say an awful lot more because everything has changed that's true so why don't you start start wherever you want with the changes since i saw you last well let me let me speak in a way that's going to hopefully make a difference for the audience because in the times we're living in we are living in times of great change and the amount of transition that I have navigated, quite honestly, in the last five or even 10 years, honestly made me uniquely qualified to deal with the challenges of the last year. Um, and I feel incredibly grateful for that because when the pandemic hit, I was in a position where instead of having to do a lot of pivoting myself, I could help a lot of other people pivot. And that overall, is the benefit of going through and navigating that change for ourselves. Even when it's hard, even when it feels like, sometimes it really feels like you might not want to be here anymore. Yeah. Um, you may really be questioning your presence on the planet. It, it, it happens. And, but navigating that change not only puts you ultimately down the road, in a place for you to be able to make a difference for other people, it puts you in a better place to make a difference for yourself. And, and, if, we, and if we become more of who we are, if we become more of a leader, if we become more evolved in whatever way that means for us, that puts us in a position to make a difference for other people as well as for ourselves, our families, and our communities. So without going into a lot of detail, um, everything for me has changed in the last several years from um, my primary relationships to uh, shifting from a solopreneur to being a CEO, going from a team of just me and a virtual assistant to having a team now going on 10 people, um, doubling the company year on year, four years in a row. 
it, it's it's just been kind of on and on and and even you know a, a lot of emotional spiritual physical changes i had covered a bunch of long-term health issues i didn't even know that i had and changed my health which really helped me grow things because i had the energy to do so so it has been a mess it has been a unbelievable tangly crazy ugly mess but what i've really come to believe and understand is that having the life of your dreams is not a pretty process, but it is so worth it. <laughs> it was so well said, and I so agree with you. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's such a great point because we're sitting here and I want people to understand, okay, we, we're all trying to navigate our way through something that people have never had to deal with basically in the past hundred years. And mm -hmm. we are so enmeshed in technology. We have gone in the past, just the past 10 years, light years ahead of where they went for the, the, the prior like 45, 50 years. Things have, the, it changes on a dime. And, um, you know, as you know, I've been doing this show since 2012. I was in the, the video space in, in 2011 and, and basically shouting to the world. So COVID in a way for me was, oh, great, I'm home. Because, <laughs> you know, like you in, in the audiobook area, in video and, and for you in podcasting, I'm used to doing this all day long with all kinds of different people in a, a myriad of different applications. And I know that it can be challenging for people because many, many people started with Zoom, okay? Eric's company that sort of came out of Hangouts and that same sort of setup hmm. has gone on to just, you know, uh, tenfold a millionfold I swear the changes they now it's been two years since I came out with a zoom phone there, there's just you know so much happening podcasts have oh skyrocketed from where they were when when you were first doing them oh yeah uh, completely okay and and with that in mind these these changes you know we we are in a time of flux and and I want I want your opinion, but I see us not really gaining sort of solid footing for another couple of years. I, I have to I have to agree with that, um, Elaine. But before I expand upon that, I'm curious about some of the trends you're seeing that lead you to say that. Well, it, it's you know it, I tend to be a bit of a futurist, so yes, for me. Yeah, back in April last year, uh, I, I voiced my opinion at a business meeting and said, you know, I, I'm sorry, I know you think and, and people are talking about by summer, we're going to be, you know, on the upside. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, folks. Okay, I hate to be Debbie Downer here. But I think we're talking years and and I got literally booed by a good friend in business who said, that's a horrible thing to say. I said, no, I'm just being real. And one of the trends, one of the things that I saw early on was with people going home to work, you're seeing a lot of corporations and even governments seeing an amazing cost savings in setting up remote workers as opposed to maintaining corporate real estate. 100%. Okay, there are big buildings now sitting empty because, you know, here here in Canada, uh, there's a lot of areas, a lot of the provinces are in lockdown. Uh, we may get a little bit of let up next week, but we've basically been in lockdown since Boxing Day. And, you know, a lot of the other countries are facing the same sort of challenges. And all of this real estate lying fallow but the corporations are seeing such a benefit to allowing remote workers to stay home. And more than that, uh, and this is something I think you can speak to too, people are happier, they're better off being able to spend more time with their families. 
Yeah, we, we see a, a lot of that. Um, a lot of my colleagues who did a lot of travel, um, professional mm -hmm. speakers, consultants, yeah. all of that, being able to demonstrate to the companies that they work with, that to the clients that they work with, that what they do can be just as effective as doing it in person yeah. completely changes accessibility. Um, yeah. And and I it's to, to some of your point on some of these, these trends, I mean, what about the diaspora of people leaving have uh, um, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, hugely yeah. high cost of living and, and Google and some of these other companies going, hey, guys, go, you know, go. we're going to keep with remote, whatever. And then there, these people are able to make their dollars and make their salaries go yeah. so much further yeah. in communities and then feed other communities in different places. Like Austin is going nuts right now in real estate. They were going yeah. nuts to begin with. Yeah. Um, other, I mean, home sales have gone through the roof single family home sales have gone through who could have predicted that oh my god and even here in ottawa yeah yeah it's actually one of the lower cost of living places in canada so yeah. of course we're going to see that you're going to see people coming out of toronto and you know all these other places so that they can have a better quality of life more dogs and cats getting adopted than any other time in history yay yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. so for all of the the perceived downside of what's going on, and I don't want to overstep or Pollyanna no. over that, you know, to keep our own sanity, to keep our own spirits alive, we do need to take a look at, well, what's the opportunity? You know, there were more millionaires created during the time of the Depression than any other time in history. Yeah. And without being predatory or opportunistic or, you know, stomping yeah. on people, where's the innovation? Where Absolutely. can we come closer together as communities, as people create more intimacy when we shed the need or shed even the opportunity to meet together in person? What can we create? I don't know about where you are, but mm -hmm. but here and and in Britain and, and France and, and other places where I deal with clients all the time, we're seeing a... Um, a, a much more open, uh, communicative, and caring attitude to those around us, to those that prior to COVID, a lot of people didn't think about all of the people that live on their own. Yeah, that's true. What do you, yeah, what do you do when you are completely on your own and you're in lockdown and you can't go out for three months? You know, they, that's, that's just a, a little piece. And, and like you're saying, I, I don't want to Pollyanna this at all, but I believe, have always believed, you, you've you known me over years, that we have to create our own joy no matter what's going on in our lives. And I'm finding that everybody are is finding little things that become much more meaningful. You know, morning yeah. routines that that maybe people didn't make time for before because you don't have that commute, because you don't have to go catch the bus or park the car or do whatever. You've got that little bit of extra time that you can, you know, if you have them spend with your kids or your dog or uh, in my right. case, it's my dog, my squirrels, my chipmunks and my <laughs> They're getting expensive, though. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's a lot of nuts. Yeah, yeah it is a lot of nuts. That's <laughs> very me. true. Yeah, you and me both. Um, yeah, and, and, and it's been interesting. Like, my kids are both teenagers. They're 16 and 14. Yeah. They're in online school. Um, they've been remarkably resilient through this. I'm, I'm really proud of them. But they also had the advantage with growing up in a mobile environment. Yes. Zoom wasn't unusual for them remote learning, remote working wasn't unusual yeah. for them. So they didn't quite have the a, a major shift like a lot of kids have had. Um, but they have the, the amount of walking and bike riding that they have done in the last year. And I'm living in Florida, so of course, it, well, yeah. except for the, you know, living in Florida in summer is like living inside of a dog's mouth. Really, it's not fun. Yeah. But nonetheless, it, you know, there's still an accessibility factor to it. Um, but they, they've actually both gotten in really good shape and, mm -hmm. you know, we all still like each other, which is kind of amazing yeah. as a family. And, uh, they've listened to a lot 
of podcasts and oh audiobooks, which is funny because with with the work that we do with podcasting and audiobooks, my kids weren't really into all of that. They were definitely more into YouTube. And that has shifted yeah. during this time period. Yeah. And so the conversation has shifted as well. And when I speak to other parents, I'm hearing the same thing when I, you know, speak to colleagues and all of that. It's the um it's where we go, this audio format is where we go when we want to take a break and either learn something different or be comforted or nurtured or fed in, in some way. And that is where podcasts and audiobooks really shine as a, as a modality. Yeah, because you can take that audiobook to your most comfy spot, that big armchair or your bed or the front porch or wherever you want to go. It's not really the same when you're having to look, even for people that are just using a phone. You can go sit somewhere comfy, put the phone down beside you and consume all the audio books you want. Yeah, a lot of folks who are doing, who picked up handcrafts, knitting, um, yeah. embroidery, different types of uh, model building. There's been a, a big surge in that, uh, along with, you know, everyone was talking about bread baking, like, you know, at one point, <laughs> yeah. cheese making. But really, that is, that's very nurturing. It's it's good okay. for us, and maybe not so great for the waistline, but good for us emotionally to to have those types of activities where they are kinesthetic that yeah. it is bringing yeah. us back to um feeling like we are connected yeah. with something yeah and and i i have to say for me i don't get that because i i can't walk and chew gum not i don't chew gum so that's maybe a bad <laughs> analogy but yeah i i just am fascinated by people who can knit or crochet or model build while they're doing something else and and i'm not i don't have the patience to bake bread so i just salivate I'll send over you some. Else's. Yeah. <laughs> oh yay oh yay <laughs> but okay so we're, we're discussing sort of where we are you know how things have changed and the concept of of sort of rolling with the punches and adapting I think it's critically important. It's critically important that our children and, and our grandchildren see that, well, we, we'll do it as well. You know, a lot of people in the early days, March and, and April, were kind of put off and, and scared by doing video or, or, or you know, having to, to be seen. But when people see that even the journalists on TV, even you know the big YouTube things that they put up, the the judge that uh, was a cat or the judge that had oh, somebody that was so, so funny. Oh my God, that was so good. But when people understand that you know doesn't matter where you are on the rungs of the ladder, people are not perfect. Okay, <laughs> I've said for years, if they're perfect, there be two of them end of sentence yeah yeah so it, it kind of gives us that that impetus to to at least give it a try yeah it is it well I'll, I'll use an example so um my mom uh, her name's christine zabrowski she has been an inc uh, many things in her life she was a pioneer entrepreneur um, they were did a work from home business when that wasn't even a thing starting back in the late 70s, early 80s, right? And she didn't even know she was a pioneer and then became an early adopter in holistic lifestyle and alternative medicine and all of that. Point is, she has been an incredible yoga teacher for over 30 years. And she had a bricks and mortar studio. Um, and she's now retirement age. I won't say her age because that's mean online, but she's retirement age. And during this time, rather than stopping what she was doing, she decided she didn't want to stop teaching. She shut down her studio and took her business online. Yeah. Now, yeah. this is not a tech savvy human being, but she figured it out. She just decided she was going to figure it out. And she is happier with her business now than she could have imagined being. And she's now starting to, she focuses on uh, yoga for uh, people over 50. 
yeah. which is a very different market. And so I've decided to in, to support her. We're revamping her website because she never had a need okay. before okay. to have a lot of online presence. She, you know, it was paper checks and cash, yeah. you know, <laughs> all of that. Now to, to serve this community, which really needs her. Um, she's got a magic voice for meditation. She, the healing that she brings to people is unbelievable. Um, you know, we're, we're redoing her website with her because now she can, she's been able to pivot. She's been able to, to do this. And if, and if she can do that, I know that a lot of the people can as well. And, and the key though was, is that she was willing to do it. She was willing to spend the time on it and slug through it. And she was also willing to ask for some help. So, um, yeah, hopefully we'll yoga by design studio.com. will have a much better website in the next month, but even if you go there, uh, now, uh, if it's calling to you, it, it's just, it's amazing the type of work that this is now bringing to a larger market because people are going online. Uh, absolutely. And, and Kina, cause it's your mom. Let's make sure that we put that on the Thank page you. with the video <laughs> so that people can go there and check it out. I will That's shamelessly plug my mom. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let's plug your mom, but we all know that I am way over 50. Okay, <laughs> I'm 65 now, so yeah, I'll fit right in with the retired I'm getting close. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting to me, my grandmother used to say all the time, yes, well, needs must, needs must. Yes. And, you know, until the past year, it was like, oh, okay, I get it. Because as much as it's amazing that your mom has done that, she's not alone. No, that's there a beautiful are, thing. Yeah, but there are a ton of boomers who are going, you know what? Okay, let's adapt. And, you know, we, we may not know how to do it, but we know people and somebody somewhere. And and that's part of, I think, the beauty. We've, I, I, hopefully you'll agree with me, but in the past, I would say five to seven years, we are seeing, you know, you're on, you're on the council. So we are seeing such a move to a more aware, awake, yeah. spiritual, understanding group of humans. We, we know that there's so much more and so many of us are coming to terms with the fact that, well, we can deal with this. We, we can, you know, make roads, we can, we can change things. And, and to that end, um, I would like you to talk about the council, your place on the council and what all that entails. The uh, Evolutionary Business Council? Yes. Oh, very cool. All right. Well, the Evolutionary Business Council um, is what I refer to as my business family. So I'm not a founding member, but I joined shortly thereafter. I've been a member for at least eight years. I've lost track. And basically what this is, is it's a global organization of um, entrepreneurs, teachers, speakers, authors, um, subject matter experts who are all devoted to collaboration and who are all devoted to bringing more transformation to the planet in whichever way that that, that shows up. So every, every single member is, uh, no matter what you teach, like even with me with podcasting and audiobooks and all of that, there are transformational principles. There are even, I would say, spiritual principles or yes. guiding missions that guide the way we do business, why we do what we do and how we do what we do. And so everybody is like that. So it's an international organization with a reach, I think of over 300 million people uh, around the globe. And uh, they're just an amazing, amazing, amazing group um, that has made a, a tremendous difference in my life and my business over that time. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, if I'm not mistaken, it did begin with a Canadian? Of course it did. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, Teresa de Grobois. She's uh, yeah. she's uh, in uh, out of Calgary, out of Cal um, and uh, yeah, very good friend, dear friend. Hey, I married a Calgarian, so um, oh. I'm a fan. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and she and she and I and Pam Bain, her director of operations, actually also started a conscious community in Costa Rica. They're actually down there right now. They've been there since COVID started, called yeah. Vista Mundo. 
And so that has actually been developing even throughout this entire process so that when things and travel opens back up again and we're ready to meet in person again, we can be having those intimate retreats in a place that is incredibly nourishing on the side of a mountain overlooking the Gulf of Nicoya, surrounded by sloths and butterflies. Um, and um, yeah, you still my heart. I know, right? Uh, so they're down there. My father lives down there. So I get pictures all the time of Costa Rica. I lived down there for two years. Um, haven't been able to get down, you know, more recently. But mm -hmm. so I get pictures all the time. And I'm like, <sighs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, up here in the frozen white north. Yes. That just the thought of it. I don't even have to see the pictures to be desperate to see. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You come from you come from from this kind of a climate originally. I did well. almost forty years living in Western New York in the snow belt <laughs> Buffalo area. So yes, yeah, yeah. yeah it's a it's a, it's a unique area living in in this kind of um, snow belt for sure. But let's let's get back to the audiobooks themselves. Mm -hmm. I have a question and, and this uh, came up with, with someone I was speaking to. I, again, small, small biz entrepreneur. Um, you know, it's, it's not a, a great big company, but it's a really important passion. And this gentleman was saying, but okay, but if I'm going to do that, well, how long does it have to be? Or like, what's too short? How do I know, you know, what's that sweet spot? And do I write in terms of an audiobook, or do I write the book and then consider that? That's uh, that's already good. So let me let me pick that apart in a couple of different ways. So let's deal with the length of the book first, because length of book is a question I get both about audiobooks and podcasts. And there's everybody's always looking for, quote unquote, what's the sweet spot? How long yeah. should my podcast be? How long should my audiobook be? So there's a short answer for podcasting that's shorter than the one for audiobooks. Okay. And the, the, so the answer for audiobooks is the length of your podcast should be as long as you can be incredibly entertaining for. Not teaching, not going on and on about what you know, entertaining. All right. And for most people, that's about 15 to 20 minutes. If you add a guest, you add another 15 to 20 minutes. If you're okay. a good interviewer who's been doing it for 10 years like you, you can get away with an hour. Um, so <laughs> that's, no. that, that's your formula. That's your math yeah. Yeah. Um, on that. The quality of the entertainment is what's most important. On a similar note for audiobooks, again, what sells audiobooks is the quality of the narration. People buy because of narration. So true. Um, yeah, specifically the audiobooks. Books, if you're talking about books in general, it's the topic. People are looking for a certain topic. There's all yeah. kinds of things we can go into there about the cover and this and that. I got to bring on my publishing partners to talk with you about that. But when somebody comes to us with an audiobook, they already have their book done from one extent or another. But one of the things we work with our partners on is when they're in the process with their clients of writing the book, that at some point early on in the editing process of the book, you need to read your book out loud. You must read your book out loud before it goes for the first round of edits or around that time, because a couple of things are gonna happen. One is you're gonna catch mistakes that you would not catch if you were to just read it with your eyeballs. Your eyeballs will fill things in. You ever been on Facebook and you see one of those exercises yeah. where it's like the word yellow, but it's written in red and your yeah. brain kind of fills in the dots or it's a sentence that all the words are jumbled, but you can still read it. Mm -hmm. Okay, visually, our visual cortex is so strong, it will gloss over mistakes. But when you have to coordinate your face, your eyeballs and your mouth together, you'll catch the mistakes. So that's really the first thing. The other thing that you'll catch is where you sound dumb, <laughs> where you sound off, mm. or where you sound weird, um, where you don't sound like yourself actually would be a better way of putting that, okay? And you can correct that. You can make it more conversational. You can make it more intimate. 
And that's what you want in, in your writing. If you think about the nonfiction books that have made the biggest difference for you, I can promise you that you will name books where you felt like the author was there with you. So that's a really important point as well. Let's see. Yeah, the author was only talking to you. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So shall I continue with about yes. length or do you have something else you want to interject? Oh, no, no. Let's, let's okay. go ahead. You were on a roll there. I, love I, am. It. <laughs> I can, I can go on and on. Uh, and I will. Um, so in regards to sweet spot for length for audiobooks, um, now we're talking about nonfiction audiobooks. Fiction yes. is a different animal. So we're going to set fiction aside completely for now. Yeah. Um, with nonfiction audiobooks that are memoir or they're prescriptive or they are um, educational, business oriented, that self help, all, all in that realm. The quality of the story is the most important thing, much more important than the length. That okay. being said, um, shorter books don't tend to off the shelf sell as well as longer books. And that is why uh, the large reason for that is because of perceived value. And it has yeah. nothing to do with your book. It has everything to do with how audiobooks are sold. Most audiobooks are sold in a membership format. Audible is a membership. Audiobooks.com is a membership. All these places are membership. So when you've got one credit a month that you're in a membership for, and you can buy any book you want, you're going to be looking for what you think is a bargain. Right. You're going to be looking for a longer book. So are you going to buy your buddy Joe's two hour audiobook that you think will be good? Or are you going to buy the 22 hour uh, master your money program from Tony Robbins? Right. So not that you need a 20 hour audiobook. Please don't do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> please don't do that. But a sweet spot, if I had to pick one, would be a 40,000 word book or a four hour audio book. Okay. Yeah. Not that you can't go shorter than that. A lot of our books are shorter than that, but there's just some things to take into consideration. And like anything, like any product, a product is only as good as its marketing behind it. Yeah. You repeat that, please. A product is only as good as the marketing behind it. Yes. Yeah. That's such a good point. Because oftentimes, this is not just with books, people put things out and think, this is incredible. You know, it's the extent of my knowledge. I put all this together, whatever it may be, product, course, book, whatever. And then they just sit on it. And there's so little marketing. And then they wonder, well, what's wrong? Why didn't it go anywhere? I've done it myself. Yeah. Yeah. Haven't we all? Yeah. Haven't we all? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, I think for authors in particular, the biggest challenge that we see authors with marketing is they get tired of their own message and they're afraid that they're bugging yeah. people. Oh my God, yeah, yeah. When you, you know, it's, for most people, it's really hard to talk about yourself and, and you know, consistently praise who you are and what you do and, and your passion and what have you. It, it, it is difficult. And it, it's not funny. for us, though, Elaine. Not for us. No. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> we have oh strong God. muscle in those areas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I had a business coach, or I have a business coach, many years ago, because I was one of these people who really did not like. I didn't bother telling any of the good things that happened or say any of you know any nice stuff it was it was just you know head down do the work and you've known me long enough to know that i've seen you and do it said, yeah she said okay i need to ask you something do you technically you work for your company right and i said well yeah she said did you take money from that company um yeah and and it it that's what keeps you going right i said well yeah she goes, okay, then take you out of the equation. It has nothing to do with you. You're marketing your company, even if that's you. 
And it took me a little bit to sort of get it. And it was like, oh, my God. Yeah, if I was working for somebody else, I would be involved in the marketing. You take home a paycheck or you pay yourself or whomever. You need to put as much in so that you can take that out. Exactly. Yeah, I love that. I love that so much. And it's it's part of the entrepreneurial journey to tease out your identity from your business and and to be able to kind of turn turn it away from you. It's not about you. It's about the people you're serving. You know, yep. you never have to sell anything. You're not a sale, like salesy salesperson. Uh, you, we know when we hear that, you, you hear it in all kinds of industries. You hear it in coaching, you hear it in money, you hear it in fitness, you hear it, it's everywhere, right? But you know when you're hearing it, right? It's like the old saying about <laughs> pornography, right? You know it when you see it, right? <laughs> That's an old one. But, you know, but that has nothing to do with Marketing, it has nothing to do with promotion. Promotion and marketing is relationships and sharing and education and being excited. And it's like telling people about the best restaurant you ever ate at. Absolutely. Absolutely. It has nothing to do with you, even if it's you delivering all the work. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and I, I will say her name is Angela Sutcliffe and she was known as the smart old broad because she's a woman on fire. <laughs> nice, she's amazing business coach. One of the smartest people I know when it comes to business. So that's my plug. You plugged your mom. I'm I'm plugging my business coach. Excellent. Another good way to 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 market is uh, to cross market. We absolutely. do a lot of that. Oh, absolutely. And I I think it's I think it's actually important because okay, word of mouth has always been important just like uh you know many many years ago i i uh, wrote an article talking about uh the fact that social media is simply the name we now use for something we've been doing forever yeah gossip you know? yeah <laughs> back in the 13th century when there was a a farrier at one end of a village and a new farrier came to town and set up at the other end. Well, at, over time, the people in the village started going to just one of the farriers because he was gentler with their horses. When he, sh- when he shod them, he was uh, okay with the kids being there. He was, you know, he just had a better demeanor, a better attitude. And over time, people would tell each other oh, well, no, go, go to this one. He just, you know, he's, he's better. And they, they didn't, I mean, the other farrier may have been just as good at what he did, but he didn't have the other, the bonus items that we hopefully share with those that we serve. Yeah, I think we're at a time in history, too, where that has become and will continue to become increasingly important. Yes. The, you know, the, the millennials, my my kids who are, you know, Gen Z, they don't want to have anything to do with anybody who they don't perceive as authentic. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, lots of people say, oh, well, you know, millennials this, millennials that. I have to say, I think it's phenomenal. Millennials and Gen Z are born with much more concern for the bigger picture, for the global good, for those around them, for diversity. Yes. Like they're just, they're light years ahead of where I was when I was a child. You know, things were so much more insular. I'm a baby boomer. We, we, we had a, you know, a different head down kind of attitude when it came to all of those things around us. We were busy, you know, carving out our our own thing and our parents could only give us what they knew. Exactly. And and we've kind of snowballed now, you know, my my kids have never known a time where there was not YouTube, where there was not email, where there was not all these things. I mean, I'm I'm an Xer and I had the, I considered an advantage of being trained in analog and digital. Yeah. Right. 
but my I'm the last of that breed, right? Yeah. That's that's yeah. never you know unless something really horrible happens, and please no, that's not going to yeah. happen again. Um, yeah. But but my kids have you know they have access to an overwhelming amount of information at their fingertips, and the way that they navigate that is through social proof. Absolutely. That's the only Absolutely. thing you can do. And, yeah. and, and hopefully, you know, as, as we're teaching them how to discern, discernment of knowledge and how to research if something is a fact or fiction, things like that, things they don't really teach in school. No. Um, you know, those, those are the things we're seeing. I mean, my daughter's a, a serious social advocate. She has educated herself. She's 14. And she, you know, puts herself into online courses and things like that around allyship and and all these other things, um, and then sends me information. Yeah. Mom, would you consider signing this con uh, this uh, petition? Mom, would your business like to donate to this particular cause? You know, all of that. I'm like, I didn't, I wouldn't, I wasn't able to do that until I was like in my late 30s. Yeah. You know, <laughs> asking people for that. So I'm, I'm excited in most yeah. ways for for the future that we're living in because. The generation that's coming up, maybe people say, oh, they're soft or they're this or they're that. I think that's just what the world needs. I think that that external view that they seem to have is much more important in this day and age. And as much as the lockdowns and, and you know, being separated from their peers and, and having to only connect to do school online has been a serious issue. Yeah. I think children are incredibly resilient when they're allowed to blossom. And yeah. and you know, millennials and and Gen Z to me are yeah, I just can't wait to see what they're going to do. Yeah, there's there's yeah, they're 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 amazing. Um, I feel really good about. Honestly, I feel really good about the future in their hands because yeah. they are so emotionally intelligent and so inclusive oh, yeah. of things that I think as as things open back up again. And I agree with you. This is going to take a couple of years. It took a couple of years with the Spanish flu as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, we can learn from that history, and you know, what they'll be interested in creating in helping each other and in creating community and keeping people included and safe. I think that 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 whole idea of a global village is closer and closer to becoming a reality. And, um, you know, the the work that you do, Elaine, I obviously see this because you're so much about bringing people together. Um, through the channels that you work with. And that's one of the re areas we resonate because that's what we do too. It's like how many positive, empowering, important messages can we get out through the world in different ways through this low hanging fruit of podcasting and audio books yeah. and, and social media, right? It's, it's yeah. easy access. Oh, absolutely. And, and working with these younger people, I think is invigorating. And I think it, we all have more in common than we would ever realize. Everybody has always had, you know, those, those generational conflicts. It, it's just the way it goes. It, it's always happened. But I think somewhat probably in time of Spanish flu, they had the same kind of, um, larger awareness for the young people. For me, the, the only thing I see that, that just breaks my heart, I was in the grocery store last week, it might have been the week before that, and there was a woman with a baby. Mm -hmm. And the baby was about five months old, maybe six, just starting to look around and starting mm -hmm. to acknowledge all the other humans. Well, what breaks my heart is the fact that we're all mass. There is an entire oh yeah, entire cohort of children in the past year have never seen a stranger smile. Now, having said that, Tyra Banks 
said you need to smize with your eyes. <laughs> I think we all need to work on that because we're going to be wearing masks for a while. But it, it just struck me because, you know, in grocery stores, you go up and down the aisles. And so, of course, the, the woman and this baby passed us a number of times. And the baby kept looking and I thought, oh, I, I just so want you to know that I just think you're lovely. And, you know, like you, you have all this promise and hopefully that got across. But it was it was a, a, a very deep acknowledgement of something that they have lost in, you know, in that first year, that first, you know, two years of life during this time, we as older humans need to make more of an effort to be able to reach out to children. I don't, I don't mean physically reach out, like don't, don't touch other people's children. Yeah. But, but you know what I mean? Like there, you have to make that effort because this new crop of children need to know that that older people care too. Yeah, I think that's really true. And I have to admit, I do have a ha have a habit when I'm out and about when I see kids of pulling down my mask and making a face or whatever, smiling at them and then popping it back up again because um, I. I'm so glad you brought this up. It it is particularly for really young babies and all of yeah. that. And they're getting enough at home. You know, they're getting enough oh, at yeah. home. I, yeah. I'm a therapist by training, and I think about the you know yeah. attachment issues and being able to recognize yeah. faces and all of the things that are critical in those first eighteen months to two years of life. And that's all. You know, you could, people did that at home for decades and hundreds oh, of yeah. years and all of that. It'll yeah. be all right. But yeah, it'll. It's a. We're, I think we may end up with a generation of kids who read faces differently who read uh, faces from the eyes you. up who read yes. body language yeah. in some different ways um you know i work with vocal leadership and the vo vocal patterns and the timber the breathing the tempo all of yeah. these things the intention behind the communication um i think we will end up sensitive in some new uh, and uh, perceptive even yeah. in some in some unique ways so that'll be interesting to see what happens Oh, absolutely. It was just something that, that sort of struck me. And, and I, you know, I acknowledge and totally agree with you that, you know, humans, we are adaptable. Yeah. And these children will be able to feel, you know, the, the people that are good, the people that, that want good for them, see it in their eyes. And yes, eventually understand the, the body language cues, because that's what we do as humans. Yeah, truth, truth, or even the energy that we give off absolutely you know absolutely. you know you just, sometimes there's somebody walks up behind you and you're like oh no oh, yeah. or oh yes you know yes. whatever the oh, case yeah. may be yeah. um yeah. you know i it, it's it's something we have innately but maybe it's going to come to the to the forefront as we become more and more um aware as, as people wow we have gone all over today haven't we um, yeah, I, <laughs> oh, yeah i knew it was going to be a meander because I I believe you have an absolute wealth of, of knowledge on so many subjects. And I am so thankful for you to give me this time. Oh, my pleasure. Um, it, it has been absolutely phenomenal. And I realize we're, we're actually coming up to the top of the hour, which, oh, my heavens. Okay. I always sort of finalize the show not only by thanking my guest for for being completely amazing but i also always want to ask what is it that you do either in your personal life or your business life some little tip or tweak or hack that you use on a daily basis that you can leave with our audience that they too can check out ah something more on the practical realm that they uh, could actually give a try themselves? Yes, please. All right. I, I'm going to do some probably a little a little bit different. Um, I'm going to give you a very quick two-minute embodiment exercise. Oh, perfect. Okay. Perfect. So we're taught how to read. We're taught how to throw a ball. We're taught how to write or type or whatever. No one ever teaches us to consciously practice choosing our emotional states. 
wouldn't that be lovely? Because we get thrown, right? Emotions come up and feeling comes up and it's like a weather vane and we get thrown from one thing to the next, right? Or we have this control and we clamp it down and we smush it. So here's a different, a totally different way of doing it. When you next time are going to go into an interview or go into a meeting or go into a conversation that's important to you, I want you to stop and for like five minutes beforehand, imagine, go into your body, close your eyes and bring up a really vivid memory of a time where you felt like the best version of yourself. I want you to think, play it through in your mind, and then I want you to imagine how that experience felt in your body and take note of the emotional states and the physical states that you were embodying during that feeling like the best version of yourself. And then I want you to imagine that infusing you and breathe it in for just a minute or two. And then that state of being, then go into your meeting or call or whatever and see what happens. If you practice that once a day, a couple times a week, all of that, you will start to be able to consciously choose how you want to feel and start to shift your emotional states on a dime. There's more to it than that, but if you just start with that little bit of embodiment exercise, it's going to change your life. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That's absolutely fabulous. I want to say thank you so much, Tina, for joining me today. This has been Tina Dietz of Twin Flames Studio. And as per usual, we will have all of her information on her page on the BBP TV show site. We will also have her mom's link to her yoga, because I think that's important too. On that note, I'll see you in two weeks. Make the very best of your today every day. Bye. Mm -hmm. Brought to you by BBP TV Show and Troll Social, helping small biz navigate.